morning, everybody, and welcome to the Berean Bible Fellowship. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Today is September 30th, so we're right at the end of September, heading into October, and heading into the last quarter of this year, which is hard to believe, you know, it, it just seems like yesterday was New Year. Uh, you know, they say as the older we get, the faster time passes, and, you know, the more busy our lives are, the, you know, things quit quickly pass by. And the way I like to look at it is with each passing day we're closer and closer to that gathering that we're all, uh, we all have a hope, our hope Amen. for. Amen. Amen. Uh, today's sermon is called Doubting John the Baptist. <laughs> Notice that there, there's that comma in there. The yeah. pause. Doubting John. You know they had Doubting Thomas and Thomas yeah. doubted Christ. You know, but even a great prophet like John had a moment of doubt. Um, that's what we're going to talk about today. You know, and, and being a Christian today can be hard. In a time where we live by faith and not by sight, we don't have the physical manifestation of God. Different from what you hear from the charismatic movement where claims of a 300-foot Jesus at somebody's bed, baseboard of their bed, of an evangelist, and that that Jesus threatened to kill him if he didn't raise three hundred million dollars, <laughs> you know. So, or people in the ministry promising great blessing if you will only sow a seed of faith. Uh, with such hypocrisy afoot, it's not hard to believe that many may have doubts about our faith. Uh, has the thought ever crossed your mind? Is God really real? If you have ever found yourself asking this question, you're not alone. During today's sermon, we will look at a saint that during a time of difficulty had a brief moment of doubt or questioning, and how by Scripture was able to rest in the confidence of his faith in Christ, the Messiah. Now, when we, we're going to look today at John the Baptist, and I, and I want to address it by looking at a couple of questions. First off, who was John the Baptist? John the Baptist was the son of Zacharias of the course of Abia and his wife Elizabeth, the daughter of Aaron. So Zechariah was in the, uh, in the temple. He was a priest of a certain order, which means that they had certain duties that they did. And Elizabeth was the son of Aaron, who was the uh, Moses' brother, uh, and who the Levite priesthood came through. Now Elizabeth was barren, and they had no children. And they were both they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and the ordinances of the Lord, blameless. Both were well stricken in years, while Zacharias was performing his priestly duties in the temple. An angel of the Lord appeared unto Zacharias, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. Now when Zacharias saw the angel, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. In Luke 1, 13 it says, But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. So he declares to him that God is going to bless them, and he's going to, even in their old age, that God is going to bless them with a son. You notice it's interesting, there's a couple of places in Scripture where God blesses a barren couple with a child, mm -hmm. and they're always in their old age. <laughs> he doesn't come along in the beginning when the woman is barren and can't have children and, and, to, and you know, relieve the, relieve the stress and the pain. Sometimes, you know, we have to go through things in life to, to gain the full knowledge of the lesson that God wants to teach us. But in Luke 1, 15 through 17, it states that it talks about who John will be, who this child will be. And it says that, For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and he shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias. To turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. And the disobedient to wisdom of the just. To make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now first off I want to address that, that saying that he was filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. 
many people look at that verse and they misread it. And I actually saw it yesterday and, and had to take a pause for a second. And I've seen that verse before and I, I've heard the explanation before, but I didn't quite remember it. But it, 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 we have to let the Bible say what it says and accept exactly what it says. It didn't say that John would be filled with the Holy Spirit in his mother's womb. And that's the application that most people put to it. That, oh, he was, he was in his mother's womb and he was filled with the Holy Spirit in, in his womb and the child kicked and he, that was a sign of the Holy Spirit. That's what many people say. Instead of looking at exactly what it says, it says that he was filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb separated from his mother's womb, outside of his mother's womb. That is exactly what it says, and that's exactly what it means. So, now what did it say that John would do? He said that he would, he would uh, turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to wisdom, and make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So what was it that John was doing? John was baptizing. He was baptizing people. That's why he called him John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. You know, people, people read the book of John, and sometimes they mistake. They're thinking, this is a book that John the Baptist wrote. No, this was John the Beloved. This was John the Apostle who was writing the book of John. Mm -hmm. so, so John the Baptist was baptizing people, inducting them into the nation of priests, preparing Israel for the coming Lord. He was the forerunner. So, as I said, John was the forerunner of the Messiah. And in Isaiah 40, 40, verse 3, it says, The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for the Lord. So get everybody ready for the coming Messiah. Get everybody ready for the King of Kings. You know, when, you, when you're having a, a coronation of a king, there's great preparation that goes on. Uh, that before that king actually sits on the throne and takes the crown. And that's what John was doing. John was preparing the nation of Israel to become that nation of priests. So they had to make a public confession that they accepted the Messiah, that Jesus Christ is their Lord of Lords, their King of Kings, their Messiah. And that's what they were doing by being water baptized. It was actually anointing them to the priesthood of what they were promised to be. Now also in Malachi 3, 1, it says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare a way before me, and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. So this talks about the covenant, the promises that were made, that Jesus Christ was coming to fulfill. And John was to prepare the people for this. And so this is what he was doing. Now, where was John at this time that we're talking about this time of doubt? Now, John had proclaimed Jesus Christ as Messiah. In John 1, 29-30, it says, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me. For he was before me. So do you think that John had a pretty good handle on who Jesus Christ was? <laughs> I think so. He, he, had, he had declared it several times. John's disciples started to follow Jesus. And in John 1, 35, 7 it said, Again the next day came after John stood and two of his disciples. And look upon Jesus as he walked, and he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. And his two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. So, John isn't stopping anyone from following Jesus. No, he's, he's, they're going with his blessing. Like, no, he, I'm not worthy to tie his shoes. He is the one who came. He is the one that I prepared the way for. So I think John had a pretty good handle at this time of who Jesus Christ is. But suddenly, John is arrested. And in Luke 3, 19 through 20, it says, But Herod the Tetrarch became reproved by him of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, and for all the evils which Herod had done, added yet this above all, that he shut up John in a prison. So, John, preparing the way, 
was calling people out on some of their more grievous sins. And John went all the way to the king, Herod, and said, what you're doing with your brother's wife is wrong. It is sinful. So he called him out on it. And Herod, being an evil king, instead of taking warning, just like when, when uh, Nathan came to David and told David, you're the man. <laughs> you are the man. You are the one who has done evil. What did David do? David repented. He repented of the evil that he had done, and he turned in the other direction. But Herod, instead of repenting, he put John in jail and, and put, him in, put him in the dungeon. So, turn with me to Luke chapter 7. We're going to cover 18 through 28. What's that again? Luke? Luke chapter 7, verses 18 through 28. And this covers the time when, when John was in jail. And think about this. Chapter what? Chapter um, 7, verse 18 through 28. So let me set the scene for you. John is in jail. Here John was the forerunner of Christ in setting up the people ready to accept Jesus Christ as Lord, ready for the kingdom to be ushered in. But now he's sitting in jail under the threat of death. What do you think might have been going through his mind? Like, am I on the right team here? Is this really the Messiah? Or maybe I'm wrong. Maybe... Maybe he's not what I thought he was. Because would I be in jail here? You know, how, how often do we, we think of a bad situation that we're in and we're like, I'm a Christian. Why am I going through this? Why am I having this difficulty? Why, you know, why is God doing this to me? I'm one of his favorite, right? I'm in the body of Christ, so why am I going through this hardship? <laughs> so, I'm quite sure many of these thoughts went through John the Baptist's mind. Like, I'm the forerunner of Christ. Why, am I, why did he allow me to get put in jail under the threat of death? So, in uh, chapter 7, verse 18, it says, And the disciples of John showed him all these things. And John, calling unto him two of his disciples sent them to Jesus, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? So even a prophet as great as John the Baptist had a time of questioning of his faith. Well, he, he's asking, he says, Are you the Messiah? Are you, are, you know, I, I know I declared you as such <laughs> several times, said you are the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, but... But my situation causes me to question, should I look for another? Are, are you really the one? And you know, how many times have we asked that? Through the, through the ridicule of our Christian faith, for the difficulties of the times that we've gone through. How many times in the secret of our room have we questioned in the, in the, in the darkness of our mind, you know, is God really real? Is is what what do I have to hold on to? Because I ha I don't have any physical manifestation of God, and if you look to the to the to the ministries today where they're speaking in tongues and doing you know you walk into a church and they're babbling on in tongues and and you know every one of us has sat in the back of our mind like these people are crazy. Mm -hmm. You know this can't be God. Mm -hmm. This can't be what God intended. So so. You know, so we have doubt. And in his time of trouble in the dark dungeon, I can see John sitting in the corner and wondering, is this the Messiah? Or should I be looking for another? Is there somebody else who's going to come along? And, and what, what is he actually asking there? Is he not asking that, is there another who will protect me and keep me from jail and keep me from the punishment of death? Part of John's doubting Christ as the Messiah was his interpretation of Scripture. 
what did John think of the coming of the Messiah would look like? John thought, as many of them thought, that Jesus Christ was going to be on the throne and that he was going to rule, not understanding that he came to be sacrificed first. So they misinterpreted that scripture. They saw the second coming of Christ and thought that's where they were. They thought that Jesus Christ was going to overthrow the Roman Empire. And they asked, they, just, they asked him such, is this the time where you're going to overthrow the Roman Empire? So that's what they were expecting. They misinterpreted Scripture, or they didn't see that there was a time before that where Jesus Christ came with a different mission, with a different intent. So John thought the Messiah was going to overthrow the Roman Empire. Most Jews confused this first coming with the second. And remember the question that the apostles asked before Jesus Christ ascended. In Acts 1, chapter 6, they said, when, when they therefore were come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? So that was what their expectations were. Amen. Verse 20 says, When the men were come unto him, they said, John the Baptist hath sent us to thee, speaking to Christ saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? And in that same hour he cured many of their infirmities and plagues, and of evil spirits, and unto many that were blind he gave sight. So while John's disciples who came to inquire of Jesus, if he is the prophesied one who would come, Jesus was healing the sick and curing the evil spirits. What do we in the body of Christ look for to comfort us that our faith is real? One, we should be looking for edification from the fellowship. In 1 Thessalonians 5.11 it says, Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. So in this time when we don't have physical manifestation, what do we receive to uplift us, to, to keep us on course, to keep our faith strong? We're edified by meeting together, by studying the scriptures together, Amen. by lifting each other up, for praying for each other, for all the things that a congregation does. And when you're not here, we miss you. Amen. We miss you when you're not here. We need that edification. Michael and I need that edification of the congregation Amen. to work on, on, on uh, uh, sermons and Bible studies and, and to spend the time that we do in leading the flock. That is a great responsibility, but we can't lead the flock when the flock's not here. Amen. <laughs> okay, so we, we exchange edification. Now what's something else that we should be looking for to uplift us and keep us on course? We should be looking for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians 1.13, it says the indwelling of the seal and the sealing of the Holy Spirit, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after ye that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. We should understand that in the body of Christ that we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. We are led by the Holy Spirit. We should measure ourselves daily. Are we producing the fruits of the Holy Spirit? Or, or am I gossiping? Am I angered? Am I malicious? You know, I, 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 sit, I looked at the... Uh, and I caught myself. I, I looked at the, uh, the hearings that have been going on this week. And all I can see with the Democratic Party is a maliciousness, a throwing away of standards, a throwing away of, of due process, of things that have made this country great and, and that we have held on to. That the fact that someone who is accused of something is innocent until proven guilty. Instead, we hear, well, I believe her because she's telling the truth. Have you ever heard such circular reasoning? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she's telling the truth because she's, she's honest. Or I believe her because she's telling the truth. But there's no evidence. There's no corroboration. What is the third thing that we should be looking at? We should be looking at the truth of Scripture. Amen. Amen. Yes. 2 Timothy first, verse 3, 1 through 7, talks about how it would look during the end times. Mm -hmm. This was written over 2,000 years ago. But it talks about how it would look during the end times. And it reads, This know also, 
that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetedness, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such turn away, for of this sort are they, they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sin, led away with divers' lust, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. You know what? Most of that explained, most of that describes what we went through last week. Yeah. yeah. False accusers having the form of godliness, leading silly women out of their homes and coming onto TV and, and yeah. spewing lies. Yeah. All right, but this, as I said, this was written over two thousand years ago. <clears throat> Can you not look at our society and, and fit it like a glove right into this time right here? So the scriptures are true. Amen. I remember my father taught a class back in 1969. I was four. <laughs> I didn't attend the class, but I heard about it from my brothers and everything. My father taught a class talking about the fall of the Roman and Greek empires and how they came down by the infusion of homosexuality and how the same thing was going to happen to the United States. So my father saw back in 1969 that, that we were headed in this direction and I've always been amazed at wow, what foresight he had. That he saw this coming. He saw what we have now coming. But the Bible sees it all. God is not limited by time or space. He knows the entire story from beginning to end. And He exposes some of it to us so that we can look at it and say, wow, the Scriptures are true. They're true. That's our proof. In 22 it says, And Jesus answering said unto them, Go your way and tell John what things ye have seen and heard, how that the blind see and the lame walk and the leopards are cleansed. The deaf hear and the dead are raised to the poor to the poor the gospel is preached. Jesus Christ was leading John to scripture. Mm -hmm. Jesus instructs John the apostle to scripture. It was prophesied what the Messiah would do when he came that he would heal the sick, the blind would see and the deaf would hear. In Isaiah 29, 18 through 19 it says, and in that day shall the deaf hear and the words of the book and the eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. The meek also shall increase their joy in the Lord. Mm -hmm. And the poor among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. Amen. So that's what he directed John to. John, you're having doubts? You don't know if I am who I really am? What, did this, what do the scriptures say? What do the scriptures say the Messiah would be doing when he came? And that's exactly what Jesus Christ was doing. You know, they ask, people ask, you know, why didn't Jesus heal everybody when he was here? Jesus Christ healed like a, like a resume. Boom. Mm -hmm. This is who I am, everybody. This is me. And the Jews had all these scriptures. The Jews knew what the Messiah would look like when he came. So it wasn't just that Jesus Christ was saying he was God. No, he was, he was demonstrating that he was God. Mm -hmm. He was giving them what he promised Israel, a physical manifestation of God. Here mm -hmm. I am. Amen. Mm -hmm. He walked among them. Yes, he did. And that's, they had a covenant with God that this is exactly what would happen. So they should, they should have known. So G, uh then Jesus answered and said unto them, Go your way. Oh, no, I read that already. Excuse me. So Jesus instructs John's apostles to scriptures. And it was prophesied what he would do. In 23 it says, And blessed is he who ever shall not be offended in me. And when the messengers of John were departed, he began to speak unto the people concerning John. What went ye, what went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken in the wind? But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they which are gorgeously apparelled, and live delicately, 
are in the king's courts. But when, what went ye out to, for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and much more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy, the, thy way before thee. For I say unto you, among those that are born of woman, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. So John endorses John the Baptist and elevates him to the place of the greatest prophet ever. But in doing this, God the Father is glorified because Christ says, He who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than John. In other words, the greatest that is the greatest that is done by the hands of man is less than the work of God. Amen? Amen. So how does this story affect our lives? How does it affect us in the body of Christ? When we stumble upon hard times, how willing are we to trust in God? Or because our kingdom hasn't come, are we doubting God? God gives us many tools in which we can navigate our walk in Christ. Some of the requirements that can keep you from doubting our Lord are, one, an active prayer life. We should be praying every day. We should be on our knees before God, communic communicating with Him. Communicating with Him like I communicate with my, with my spouse. Going to Him with your needs and prayers and desires. Seeking what God's purpose for your life is. Seeking what is, God, what is His will. And instead of asking, well, God, I would like A, C, B, C, and D, God, how about just giving me what you have, what you want me to have? Because I understand that whatever you want me to have mm -hmm. is so much better than whatever I can come up with Amen. for myself. Yes. Okay? We should be looking to conform your will to God's will. Mm -hmm. Say, God, make, change my will to what you want for mm -hmm. me. So that I know my prayers will be answered. Do you think if you conform your will to the plan that God has for your life, do you think He won't answer what He wants for you? Mm -hmm. He's already made provision for it. Yes. He's just waiting for you to get on the right path. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Reading the Scriptures daily. The more Scripture you take in, the more you will recognize God and His work in your life. When you read Scripture and you, you, through reading the Scriptures, are conforming your mind. That's where the battle is. The battle is in your mind. But when you conform your mind to the ways of God, then you're able to be illuminated to what, he is, he is, what provisions He's made in your life and the direction that you want Him to go. Mm -hmm. I remember telling my son once, I said, God will never give you what will destroy you. Amen. So you may want some incredible blessing in your life and, and not understanding that if God was to give you that blessing, it would lead you away from Him. Yes. And He's yes. not going to give you that which would lead he, you away from Him. Amen. Also, the better you will understand God's intent for your life. Amen. Yes. His, his desires will come clear when you're conforming your mind to Him and His will. Yes. In that, you'll stop playing lotto thinking God will bless you through gambling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You'll stop sowing seeds to scoundrels thinking that you can purchase God's blessing mm -hmm. and that God works off a percentage. Yeah, right. mm -hmm. yes. You will go to the throne of God and you will, you will sacrifice yourself. You will sacrifice your will and say, God, what is it that you want for me? Yes, amen. 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 But, even, but even, even the greatest prophet who ever lived who Jesus Christ put his stamp of approval and said, there's none greater than John. Mm. Mm. Even he had a moment of doubt. Yes. Yeah. As we all do. Mm -hmm. As we all do. You know, We wonder, is the rapture ever going to happen? Is, is, is it going to happen in my lifetime? Mm. Am, am, am I going to be so blessed to see it? You know, we as human beings have a hard time wrapping our minds around that which we haven't seen. But it is, it is by faith that we believe all that Jesus Christ has uh, manifested to us. And He's given us His Word, and His Word is true. But how can you believe that which you won't read? 
Okay, so you got to get into scriptures. You got to understand his word. Oh. So, continue, continue in his faith. Continue in your faith. And the building of, of the amount of scripture that you have in your soul will will increase and strengthen your faith. Praise God. Yeah, more importantly than reading the scriptures is rightly dividing the scriptures. Yes, it is. Amen. Yes, it is. Because you can read it all you want, and if you don't, you, 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 divide, if you, you don't have the key, you you want to have a great example of right division uh, along with this sermon. John's misinterpretation of what the Messiah would look like, what the Messiah would be doing. This is what caused his doubt. The fact that the picture that he had in his mind is not what this, what, what Jesus Christ was doing. That Jesus Christ was not coming in a blaze and and and, chain, and overtaking the government because he had not he had not understood that that Jesus Christ came first as a lamb to be, to be slaughtered. Yes. And it wasn't that the scriptures did not divulge this. They did. The scriptures said that Jesus Christ was coming to pay for the sins of the world first. But as I said, sometimes when we read scripture, if we don't rightly divide, then we're not going to get the message correct. We're going we're to in, we're gonna intermingle things that should not be. And in that, we're going to uh, misinterpret God's we're gonna be confused. intent. We're going to be confused, exactly. So... Learn to rightly divide the scriptures. Amen. Amen. You want to go ahead and close up in prayer, Michael?